my pleasure to welcome Dan Chi Chen uh, from Stanford to here. Um, so I think I first know Dan Chi from her work back in 2012. Uh, that was um, 2013. The, 2013. I haven't started. I, it. Okay, really, <laughs> I keep forgetting the, the year. Um, but anyway, that was the paper on the um, large phase computation. Um, <clears throat> Uh, very impressive work, and then um, I think the following summer I tried to hire her as intern, but she for uh, I, and I think I lost the competition to my colleague, so she <laughs> actually did an internship with uh, uh, another researcher at MSR at the time, um, and then she has done since then done a lot of interesting work, um, especially like last year um, her work on machine com convention um, um, basically debunked the. Um, DCN daily mail uh, data set from DeepMind um, essentially sealed the fact of, fact of that uh, data set so that data set was actually just released for one year and then s since then she's paper nobody is actually uh, really using that data set anymore. Um, so anyway, so without further ado, I think uh, then she's going to tell us more interesting inside the story today. Um, yeah. Thanks Scott. Thanks for coming everyone. So today I'm going to talk about reading comprehension and open domain question answering that I have been working a lot of in the last two years. First, I want to talk a bit about why I actually want to work on reading comprehension. So teaching our machines to read human natural language is our central and long-standing goal of natural language processing. So how can we actually enable our machines to read such a simple paragraph? So throughout many years of efforts, we have built more and more powerful NLP tools to analyze and understand different aspects of our text. So back to 2015, I was also many focusing on syntax parsing at the time. But actually, I was thinking about a question that a really central question is that, um, why should we build these tools? What, actually, how can we even evaluate machine's reading ability? So I finally arrived at this answer. I think the answer is the reading comprehension as question answering. Just like our, how our human beings are being tested the ability of language understanding, we should ask our machines questions about what is a read. Reading comprehension is actually not a new topic. Actually, as early as 1977, researchers already recognized the importance of reading comprehension. So in this uh, report back to 1977, it says that only can, when we can ask a program to answer questions about what it reads, will we be able to begin to access that program's comprehension. Also, we can, in, since questions can be designed to query any aspect of text comprehension, the ability to answer questions is the, probably the strongest possible demonstration of understanding. So reading comprehension can be cast as a question answering task. So the, reading, the input to the uh, reading comprehension system can be think of sort of the, the, like a passage of text and a question, a, central, a comprehension question about this passage. And the goal of the reading comprehension is to answer, the question, uh, answer the, this question about this passage. So if we have a passage like a short, um, short story like this, Sarah wanted to play on a baseball team. She had never tried to swing a bat and hit a baseball before. Her dad gave her a bat, and together they went to the park to practice. And if we try to ask a question about this um, paragraph, why was Sarah practicing? So we should expect that we hope that we can build a system that can actually understand this paragraph and finally answer she actually wanted to play on a team. So the next thing I'm trying to convince you is that even though the reading comprehension has been recognized, the importance of reading comprehension has been recognized for over 40 years, but reading comprehension is actually a really new field in the natural language uh, processing community. Why should I say that? Really, before 2015, we hadn't had any statistical NLP systems which are capable of reading such a simple passage and answering questions. So I will talk about this in two aspects. So from the data set aspect, before 2015, we really only have two data sets in this form passage question answer, that's the MC test and the process bank. 
So both of these data sets only consist of 2,000 questions or 500 questions. If we look at the system aspect, before 2015, most of the systems we have built actually the hand-built systems or like linear classifier with linguistic features. So what has been changed after 2015? So you can see that a lot of lot data sets just come out in the last two years. This data set is actually collected from uh, different, uh, different corporal like news, uh, news articles or Wikipedia or like a uh, children, book children, book, children books and they are trying to characterize very different aspects of the language understanding. But a common thing among all these data sets is that they all contain 100,000 questions. So by this uh, data scale, we are, we, st we are starting to be able to build like reading comprehension systems to try to understand the text and answer questions. So if we look at the system aspect, there is actually has been a revolution that all the um, hand-built systems or the linear classifiers have been involved into the end-to-end -end neural networks that I will explain uh, in a minute. So the next thing I'm hoping to um, convince you is that even though this field has been really, really new, but the growth progress has been really rapid. So if we, you, pro you probably haven't heard about this Stanford question answering data set. So since this data set was released in uh, last year, in, in June last year, the authors have built a um, traditional logistic regression over linguistic features, which include the depends parts and uh, backwards and um, sound like word distance. And the, that system can only achieve like 51 um, F1 score. And just after two months, a deep learning system had beaten the logistic regression baseline by over 20 points. And after that point, the numbers, the numbers keep growing. And uh, by, the, by the last month, the best system, best single system on the Stanford question answering system, uh, question answering data set has already achieved 85.3. And the human performance about 91.2. So the gap is already pretty small. And if we consider like ensemble models, the gap is really, really small at this point. So today for this talk, I'm going to cover a few things. So first, I wanted to introduce a model that we have actually built about two years ago. We call it Stanford Attentive Reader, that we built this system for um, advancing the reading comprehension. And the next um, part, I'm going to talk about um, how we can actually leverage the reading comprehension systems for the even broader domain and for open domain question answering. And I think many of you have uh, actually been working in this space. So today I would like to um, spend a bit more time on the dis discussions and also talk about the future directions and also the main challenges we are currently facing. So I will start by talking about this model that we have built. We think it's a pretty like elegant and, uh, and, um, and a simple model uh, we call Stanford and Tentative Reader. So I will first st start by talking about this data set that we, use, uh, we used to build this uh, model. So this data set, um, CN Daily Mail data set, uh, actually constructed by the uh, DeepMind researchers in the end of 2015. This is probably the first um, ever large scale reading comprehension data set. So they actually made use of this idea that there are a lot of news articles on the CN Daily Mail and each news article is accompanied by these story highlights. And they try to choose a um, a story highlight and take this as a question and then try to black out one entity that uh, um, in this story highlight. So the hypothesis is that if a, if a, a machine reading, a reading comprehension system is able to understand this, news, this article, it should be able to predict this missing entity. So this is what a real uh, data example looks like. So this, uh, the DeepMind researchers actually uh, run uh, entity recognizers and try to replace the real entities by these entity markers, like entity four, entity six. So you can see there is a placeholder in this question. So, um, so the goal of this task is trying to read this passage, 
trying to read this question and then finally try to infer the w what entity this placeholder refers to. So for this example, the answer is entity six. A great advantage of this data set is that you, you can pretty easily um, get a lot of data just by these like, heuristics. So this data set actually contains of, um, consists of over one million training examples, and you can get this just for free. So the first question um, at that time we were trying to solve is that, can we actually try to build a simple end-to-end -end neural network to a model to tackle this problem? And how is this actually different from the feature-based linear classifiers? So we actually first tried to build a simple linear classifier. This is uh, basically like um, for each candidate entity, we are, we are trying to build a conventional symbolic feature vector we call the F, um, PQ of um, for each entity E, we build this feature vector. And uh, then we use um, eight set of features, which includes the dependence parts and backwards and word distance. And this model is super simple. And the goal of uh, training this model is try to um, score the um, correct entity over all the other uh, candidate entities. So the next model we were trying to build um, is actually an end-to-end -end neural network model. So we see that the input of this model is still the passage in question. And the goal is to infer the answer. So how is that different from the uh, linear classifiers? So the high level idea is pretty simple. So we, are tr we were trying to encode this question. And then next, we, are, we were trying to encode the passage. Then we, were, uh, we tried to model the interaction between the passage and the question. And then finally, we are trying to infer the answer. But the difference is that all these representations are operated in the vector space instead of the symbolic um, um, indicator features. So I'll talk about how this wor uh, model works exactly. So, um, so we first try to encode this question representation. So we have this question, including the, this placeholder. And then we um, try to encode the, each word in the question with the vector representation with the word embeddings. Then we run. Sorry. So we run a, f a forward LSTM from left to right. Then we run another uh, LSTM from the right to left. Then we finally concatenate the representations of the last, uh, the last 10 steps and uh, get this question representation. So the next thing we, we, do, we did is that we run another independent bidirectional LSTM to try to encode this paragraph. So for each uh, token in this paragraph, so we have also have a vector representation. We call this tilde pi. Okay, so we get this. Um, um, so for each token in this paragraph, we are also using our bidirectional LSTM to encode. So at each position, we have this hidden representation we call it tilde pi. So the next thing we are going to do is that we are going to compute the attention function. It's basically, there's a representation a vector for the question Q, and for each position, we have this tilde pi. Then we have this bilinear term ws in the middle, and then we apply a softmax. Basically, the RFI is a probability distribution, which captures which part of the document actually relevant to this question. So actually, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me, and I'm happy to answer. So the next step we are going to do is that we, so we have this uh, pro, um, attention function. We are going to compute a weighted representation of the hidden representations, and then we call this output vector. And the next thing is that we are going to do just um, use this output vector to make a prediction. And for this example, the answer is like we, are, we hope that the system is able to predict entity six. Is there any question about this part? So I forgot, how large is the, uh, the data of each candidate entity? Um, about hundreds for each example, yeah. Okay, I will first show you some experiment results and uh, I will talk about uh, more interesting things. So when we wrote this uh, paper and uh, designed these uh, two models, 
we had two baselines from the mind of Facebook I research, and they can get like um, 60 ish on the CNN the Daily Mail data sets. And the, we first found that actually the, our linear classifier was not that bad. It's actually pretty, um, it can also achieve like 67 or 68 on these two data sets. It basically can match the uh, state's art at that point. And the first move, we actually found that the neural network model actually can perform even much better. It's basically like um, about 75% accuracy on these two data sets. So that's roughly like 10% improvement over the state's art. So we were, at that time, we were pretty happy with these numbers. But we, more importantly, we were wondering like, what level of language understanding is actually needed to solve these tasks? So what have the current models actually learned? So we did a data analysis about, about this um, task. And we are trying to characterize the different aspects of the uh, examples and they're trying to understand what these models have learned and where they can do well and where they cannot. So we divide the data examples into six categories. We call it that match paraphrasing partial clue multiple sentences and, as, um, and also a few um, error cases and hard cases. So I will explain this a little bit. So for the exact match case, so the first line is the, the question. The, sex, the second line is a sentence that appears in the paragraph. So if you can see that, if we can see the words uh, surrounding the placeholder in the question can be exactly found in the uh, paragraph, then basically this question is pretty trivial. Then it's super, it's super easy to predict that the, uh, the answer of, uh, um, to this question is just entity 12. So the next case we call it paraphrasing. We think this is a really important uh, one um, for the language, natural language understanding is that we cannot find an exactly match in the paragraph, but we can find uh, like one sentence in the, par uh, in the paragraph that's basically a paraphrase of the question. So if the question is asked about, placeholder says he understands why entity zero won't play at his tournament. And the paragraph mentions that entity zero calls me personally to let me know that he wouldn't be a playing here at entity 23, entity three said. If the system is able to understand that these two, um, two sentences are paraphrase of each other, then it should be able to predict that the answer should be the entity three. Um, yeah. Okay, the next example is that, the uh, next case we, we define this as partial clue is that we actually cannot find an exact case in the paragraph, an exact sentence that's a paraphrase of the question. But we can actually get some clue from the um, sentence based on the properties of the entities. So if we see that, the so question is um, about a TV movie based on Entity 12's book, placeholder cast an Entity 76 actor as Entity 5. And the, the paragraph mentions that Entity 11 is not a religious book. So we can probably infer that the so question is asking about a book, and the Entity 11 is a book. So it's probably that um, this should be an answer that we are looking for. The so next case is actually pretty hard, is that we actually cannot use just one single sentence in the paragraph to infer the answer. We actually need to read multiple sentences and finally get the answer. So if you see this example, then the system has to read like two or three sentences and finally figure out the answer is entity 17. So we, so we analyzed like 100 examples on this data set and we found this such a distribution. So first, the paraphrasing and the partial clue actually are the two uh, biggest classes. They account for 60% of the examples. And then we also found that multiple sentences actually only accounts for like two, uh, two out of the 100 examples. So it's really not too much. And uh, besides that, actually like 25 examples, 25% 25 of the examples are actually pretty hard and also involve some reference errors. So if you remember that the current um, neural network systems already can achieve like 75% accuracy on this task, it basically means that uh, the, the, the system can already achieve pretty well on this task because uh, consider there are so many error cases. 
So we also try to understand that. So how is the neural network system different from the um, categorical feature classifiers? So we try to see the per category uh, accuracies for the two systems. So the first thing we see is that for the exact match case, it's really just like kind of true that both of the systems can get like 100% correct. And for the multiple case, because there are only two cases, both of them get only one correct. And for the, this coreference and the error hard cases, both of them actually cannot get very well. So the accuracies are pretty low. So what actually makes a real difference is the two biggest class in the middle, the paraphrasing and the partial clue cases, we can see that the neural network models can actually um, obtain like 95% and 90% accuracy on these two, two uh, categories. But the conventional classifiers can only achieve like 78 and 74. At this point, so we want to conclude that the bidirectional OSTMs plus attention models actually are really good at learning semantic matching. So the next question we were wondering is that, does this actually can work in a real question answering setup? Because we were, um, the deep CN daily mail data set actually constructed by a cost style way and in a heuristic manner. So we actually, uh, we're uh, so does this actually can work on a real question answering um, task? So the next I'm going to talk about this Stanford question answering data set. This actually came out after um, we developed the Stanford attentive reader model. So, yeah. Sure. So I agree that 100 is a bit or too less, but actually we try to do uh, another 100, like 200, and uh, we found that the basic the convolution still holds, but we didn't include that after that. Yeah. Okay, I will continue. So, um, so if you have, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the Stanford question answering data set here. Uh, sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, basically the, um, the setup for the Stanford question answering is a score data set is that the passage is actually a real paragraph selected from the Wikipedia. And the question is actually written by Turkers, by the annotators is crowdsourced. But there is a restriction is that the answer must be a span in this passage. So here's a real example from the score. So the question, um, here's the question, here's the passage. So does anyone know that what's the answer to this question after you read the passage? <laughs> yeah. So if the system has to get this correct, it has to understand the first two sentences and finally figure out this span, many of the nomadic tribes of Northeast Asia. So this is what like uh, Scott looks like. So uh, this is probably a kind of hard case. Yeah. So um, the next thing um, we tried is that we, we were wondering like if such a simple model can actually perform really well on the um, Stanford question answering data set. So we actually did exactly the same thing, except that we, now we have a real question. Um, so we still use a, a bidirectional OSTM to encode the question, and then use another bidirectional OSTM to encode the paragraph, and then we compute this attention function. But uh, we don't have to predict the um, answer from uh, like a set of the entities. So we the goal is to predict the span in the paragraph. So we just use this attention function to predict the start position of the answer. And the next, um, because we are going to predict span, so we just copy this attention function and using another gr um, group of ways to predict the end position of the answer. So, so actually what we have actually made change to the Stanford Attentive Reader is that actually how we should actually represent this paragraph um, representations. So we actually 
try to consider several components into this paragraph, into the paragraph level of token representations, which not only includes the word embedding, linguistic, uh, and also includes of linguistic features. But also we actually include two sets of features in the paragraph token reputation. One feature we call it that match, is that, which means that it's basically just a zero one feature which indicates a word, whether the word appears in the question or not. And also we have this aligned question embedding. Basically we are trying to um, model the similarity between words in the vector space. So we are going to compute the similarity between the different words and then compute the weighted average of the word embeddings. So we call it aligned align question embedding. So I have an explanation about the difference between the exact match and aligned question embedding. So here you, ha you can see a question, also the sentence in the paragraph. So the, basically the exact match feature captures this hard alignment basically exact the words between the gas in the question that appears in the question and also the uh, words that appears in the passage. But we also should have this like soft alignment because you cannot find an exact match between the mix of and the constituents. But the hope is that the, this um, aligned question embedding can actually can, can capture this kind of soft alignments. So we also perform some like ablation studies on these feature selections. And the, the full model actually can get like 78.8 accuracy. And if we just remove the uh, linguistic features, it's only like 0 0.8 uh, job. It's not that much. And if we remove this exact match feature, it's only like 1.5 loss. And if we also remove this uh, line question embedding, so the performance like dropped like also by 1.5. But actually what is dramatic here is that if we actually remove the, uh, both the exact match feature and also the aligned question embedding, the numbers can actually drop by like 20 points. So we think that how we can actually model this direct alignments between the words in the question and also the word in the passage are pretty crucial to solve uh, like th this question answering task. So these two sets of features, they are probably play a pretty similar role, but they're also kind of like complementary. So next I'm going to show you some results that we got. So when we developed this system, like in March, like that is like uh, eight months ago, our systems were pretty good. Just by this sub, uh, simple system, this system was able to reach, get like 79.4 F1 score on the Stanford question answering data set. But of course, the numbers still uh, keep growing up. So we are not that good so far after eight um, months. So the state of art of the Stanford question answering system is like about 85.3. So we are l roughly like six points behind. So actually what actually country has been changed after uh, in, in the last eight months and what can actually contribute these six points. So I put a, a diagram from a um, paper from Microsoft um, so it's called a FusionNet. So you can see that um, the real newer model is actually pretty much more complicated with a lot of layers and attention uh, functions. So we actually um, um, we found that, so what actually contributes these uh, six points and what can actually further improve the numbers can probably be uh, like these factors, which includes uh, character embeddings and also contextualized vectors. And the, like also the self-attention self which tries to model the dependencies between the two tokens in the paragraph. And also people try to stack with more layers and with, and, uh, with residual connections. So all these like, uh, recent improvements in the deep learning community actually can bring the numbers a bit higher and higher. And then now the state of the art is roughly like 85.3 uh, with a single model. So next I'm try I would like to show you a few cases that I do believe that the current neural network systems are still struggling and are still probably the fairly cases. I think these are pretty interesting one. So the question is, what is the total number of professors, instructors, and the lectures at Harvard? And then you can see there the sentence mentioned in the paragraph that 
Harvard's 2,400 professors, lecturers, and instructors instruct 7,200 undergrads and 14,000 graduate students. So you can see that the current systems actually can be uh, can correctly recognize the right type of the um, answer and try to understand what the question is asking about. But it actually cannot recognize that. Uh, 2,400 is actually the modifier of the professors, lecturers, and instructors. And the 7,200 7, is the modifier of the undergrads. It's not able to distinguish this and then make a wrong prediction. So basically, this case tells us that maybe we actually need some syntax that can uh, try to solve such cases. So here is another example that uh, I think most of the current systems still fail. So the question is, what is the population of the second largest city in California? If the system should, um, need to un uh, answer this question correctly, it has to find out the first sentence in this paragraph. And then also find out that there are two cities mentioned in, the par uh, in this paragraph. And, uh, they are both they are the two largest cities, and also the population actually mentioned in the brackets, and, the, and they have to figure out which is the second largest. So this probably is still really is beyond the scope of the current reading comprehension systems. Probably for this case, we actually need some like semantic parsing or something like that. So next, I will move on and talk about that how we can actually leverage the reading comprehension system to solve even broader and open domain question answering. Before I um, move on, actually I need to talk about um, the limits of the SCOT um, data sets. Even though we can actually pr um, perform pretty um, good numbers on the uh, such sample question answering data set, but it's actually still a pretty restricted question answering setup. There are for two reasons. The first reason is that it actually requires that questions must be answered by the, this span selection. So not actually all the questions can be answered by this um, setup. And the second um, reason is that when Turkers try to write the questions for this um, paragraph, they actually can see this paragraph. So that basically causes cause that there should be a high lexical overlap between the question and also the paragraph. This also explains that why the alignment between the question and the paragraph is so important for solving the Stanford question answering data set. So, so we actually, so the reading comprehension system can actually um, perform so well on this reading comprehension tasks. So we are wondering like, if this, uh, can we actually leverage this system for even broader open domain question answering? So the next, I'm going to talk about systems that we have built early this year. And we call this system Dr. QA, and this is like collaboration with some um, researchers from Facebook AI research. So the system, the high level picture of the Dr. QA system is that we want to actually make use of the Wikipedia, English Wikipedia as the only large source and they try to enable the, um, the system to answer any questions that people might ask about the world, any other factoid questions. So this system actually works as follows. So if we um, input a question like how many words of inhabitants spoke Polish in 1933, so the system consists of two modules. We call it document, document retrieval and document reader. So the document retrieval is actually an information retrieval component, which tries to scan all the articles in the Wikipedia, and it tries to find out the most relevant articles um, to this question that we, we care about. And then we can leverage the reading comprehension system, we call, uh, we call document, document reader here, to try to carefully re read these articles, and finally arrive the answer, like this number, uh, and, uh, yeah. So in summary, Dr. QA is actually a combination of the information retrieval module and also the reading comprehension module. So we are trying to leverage this reading comprehension system to try to answer any open domain questions and see like how, how good we can get. So we actually integrate this uh, Dr. QA system into the Facebook Messenger and we are trying to play with it. And, um, 
we, we found that for like general factorial questions, they can actually can um, answer questions pretty well. So if you ask some question like, who invented LSTM? And then it can give you the right answer. And then if you ask questions like, where is Stanford University located? And the system is able to answer. I'm quite confident the answer is California. Now, if we are going to ask, like, what is the highest mountain on Earth? And it can give you the right answer. And also, what year was the American Declaration of Independence? And then it can return the answer to 1776. So we found this actually works pretty well. And I will explain that how we actually built this Dr. QA system. So besides the scores, um, data set that we just talked about. We were trying to collect more question answering um, benchmarks and data sets that people have been used in the um, past like 20 years, which including the, um, the track question answering uh, data sets, which is uh, many derived from the new um, corporate and also the uh, government documents. And besides the track question answer, uh, question answering data set, we also leverage the two data set web questions in the wiki movies. These two data sets actually were designed for the large based question answering, not for the text based question answering. But we are trying to see that how many questions we can actually answer just from the Wikipedia and try to leverage, use the reading comprehension system to answer these questions. So I actually have one more slide about this um, uh, large based question answering. So the setup is totally different. So for the web questions, if you ask a question like when did Barack Obama and Michelle Obama get married, the large based question answering system has to find out the relevant um, information in the large graph in the free base and try to finally arrive to the answer. But we just try to use the Wikipedia to answer such a question and see like what we can get. So I want to emphasize that uh, there's a quite different setup here. So first, we are trying to examine that how good. Um, so we built a, like a document retrieval module that basically like a, um, TF-IDF uh, plus a background hashing. Uh, it's basically a pretty standard information retrieval module. And then we've actually found that this system, this module actually works pretty well. And the 70 to 86 percent of the questions, we actually can have the answer segments that appears in the top five articles which is actually works much better than the default Wikipedia search. So the next thing, the next thing we tried is that we just want to see if, that, um, if we can combine with this uh, document retrieval module and uh, if we have a pretty good score model, whether this model can do something on, in the full uh, Wikipedia scale. So we actually found that the numbers are not that high. But they actually, they, the whole system, because it's a really challenging setting, the input is just the whole English Wikipedia. So, but the system is still able to answer like um, about 90% accuracy, 90% uh, of the questions correctly, but it's a bit low on the web questions. And I also want to emphasize that we only use the top one prediction, also the exact match. So this is a really restricted uh, uh, setup. So we, because for the web questions, the goal is to predict the entity that appears in the free base. So we are just trying to match, uh, to try to predict the string and see if that is correct or not. Some of the swap questions are, compa are paragraph. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, presumably you have no hope of getting those right. Yeah, I think so, yeah. So then, um, so we were wondering like, can we actually try to leverage more data? to train a better reading comprehension model and then see if we can get better numbers on the uh, um, uh, like a broad range of the question answering data sets. So the next thing we actually tried is that we want to see if we can generate more da uh, training data by this distance supervision technique. So the idea is that for those question answering data sets, we have the question answer pairs. But now we have a pretty good um, document retrieval module. So if we can retrieve a paragraph using the document retrieval module, and the answer can be found in the paragraph. So we can probably can create a training example in the form of the paragraph question answers for the reading comprehension systems. So we actually played with these um, techniques, and uh, then we found that we can actually generate more training examples for the um, training the reading comprehension systems. 
So I actually um, make these numbers great here is because these are actually only the question and answer um, pairs. And we are trying to generate more training examples that is in the, in the form of the triples. So here is example. So if we have a question answer um, from the track, this is a real example from the track. And now we leverage this document retrieval module. And then we found a Wikipedia paragraph. And then we found that the answer is actually appears in this paragraph. Then we can actually create a training example of the question, the paragraph question answer. So the next thing we, are try, uh, we want to under, uh, see is that if this distance supervised data can actually help us uh, get better performance on the open domain question answering. So, so the first thing we try is that we start from a pre-trained scan model, but we are, tr we are going to um, fine tune the model on the, uh, each portion of the distance supervised data. And we actually found a like uh, improve, uh, actually boost on the, uh, on the web questions and the wiki movies data sets and also like about six, six point on the track data set. So at this point, we actually can answer like about over 20% uh, percent of the questions correctly and uh, like 34% of the questions cr um, on the wiki movies. And the one more thing we try is that we try to concat make use of all the data we had, including the scholar data set and also all the um, distance supervised data. And we f see that this model can actually do even better than the uh, fine tuning model. And we, um, we now, right now, basically we can achieve like a 20 and the 30, 20 percent and 36 percent of the accuracy on this data set. So you, at this point, you might wonder like what, how high these numbers are actually. Okay. Uh, actually, so I can show you some numbers that from the state are the open domain question answering system, the, the Yoda QA, which actually modeled up the IBM the deep QA system. So we are actually not there yet, but I want to emphasize that these two systems actually not um, cannot be directly comparable because the Yoda QA system actually really let, make use of the free base directly. So if you have the free base system, the, the Swift R, if you have the free base, the Swift R system can achieve like 40% uh, correct on this data set. But we can get like 20% uh, on this large base question answering data set. So we think um, the, the current system still has a, a, a lot of promise to like um, answer even more questions. So, um, so the, the initial goal of this project is that we want to build a system to uh, uh, try to uh, enable open domain question answering. But we actually, there's a lesson we actually learned from this project that combining with a retrieval module, distance supervision is indeed an effective way of creating reading comprehension data sets. So if you only have the question and answer pairs, then you should try to make use of a retrieval or search, web search engine to pair with the documents. And then we can, there is a great chance that we can get a lot of more data to train the reading comprehension systems. So one more, um, so at this point, I need to talk about this trivial QA data set developed by the people from the University of Washington. That, so they developed this system basically at the same time as we developed the Dr. QA system. But the idea is really uh, similar. So they basically start with the trivial question answer pairs, and they try to use a web search for pairing documents. So in this, uh, um, in this distance supervision manner, they can create 650,000 uh, triples uh, in a pretty cheap way. And now we also think the trivial uh, QA is actually a more realistic setup compared to Scott because you, the Turkers, you don't have the Turkers to write the questions based on the paragraph. So this also poses a lot of more challenges for the reading comprehension systems. So we actually played around with this data set after this data set came out. We just used the system that we developed before. And then we found that the current model actually can still do pretty well. Uh, it's like about over 60 F1 score on this data set. So, so it's still not um, as high as the score setup, but it basically says that the current reading comprehension system can still do pretty reasonable, reasonably well. So here is a 
uh, result from the, actually from the uh, AI to here. So I want to point out that. So this very recent paper showed that um, they have achieved with the distance super, uh, with the reading comprehension system, they can achieve over 66% F1 score on the unfiltered version of true, true QA. So I think these numbers are not dire really directly comparable to the doctor QA numbers, but it's also sh it's a great demonstration that the, if we combine the information retrieval and also the reading comprehension, it has a great opportunity to achieve the open domain question answering. So next, I'm trying to conclude and also talk about the future directions. So at this point, I hope that I have convinced you that the reading comprehension is a really important test bed for evaluating a machine's language understanding ability. But on the, on the other hand, I deeply believe that if we can really develop really good reading comprehension systems, the techniques we have built our reading comprehension systems will be a crucial component to many natural language understanding applications in the future, which could, probably could include the information extraction, summarization, and the question answering. And the large scale data sets and the deep learning systems demonst demonstrate great opportunities for advancing the ability of reading comprehension. So we have been doing way, way better than we just have um, had a few years ago. But however, there is still really a long way to go. So I want to talk about the two key um, research questions here. I will still talk about the data set aspect and also the system aspect. So on the system, as on, on the data set aspect, I think a really central question we should ask here is that, how can we actually quantify the difficulty and the prerequisite skills for a machine's reading ability? And what is actually a good mechanism to collect the data sets that we actually really want? So what kind of a capacity we want to have the machines to have and what kind of data sets we sh really should collect? And on the system aspect, I want to um, first conclude that the neural network models, especially the LSTM plus attention models, are a class of very powerful models for learning the paraphrasing and the semantic matching. Do we actually need more structure and modularity of language in our models? So next, I'm, I would like to talk about two um, uh, bigger questions. The first question is that, do we actually still need a large basis? So um, I just showed this paradigm that if we start with the Wikipedia, if we can combine with the information retrieval and the reading comprehension system, the current, the current system has a chance to directly read the documents and finally uh, um, uh, answer questions about the, um, the like whole text co uh, collection. And another paradigm that people, a lot of people are probably familiar with is that, so people also try to, um, spend many years trying to construct using the techniques from the large base construction and to build a database. And then we can have the like large base question answering techniques to try to achieve the question answering. So what should be the paradigm that we should adopt, uh, we should work towards in the future? Especially, I put the Wikipedia here, especially if we have a really new domain like medical not documents, should we try to first try to build a machine reading system um, to directly read the documents, or should we still try to apply the large base construction techniques to build a database around the text we have and then apply the large base question answering data, uh, uh, large base question answering techniques? So I think um, I don't really have a direct answer to this. I think they have like pros and cons, but I really think the current machine reading systems have been really performing really well. So I want to talk about some advantages and disadvantages of the, the large base uh, um, uh, paradigm. So the advantage is that if we have built this large basis, they're actually more structured and more clean. And uh, it's probably more easier to model more structure, uh, more compositional questions using some techniques like semantic parsing. But however, the large base construction itself is actually really time consuming. And it's, it's also limited to rigid schema and also is probably limited by the, the coverage is always an issue. So the large base is probably cannot support all the questions. But on the other hand, I also do believe that 
the reading, if we can build a reading comprehension system better, the reading comprehension system, the modules uh, the, from a reading comprehension can probably also help us build better large bases. And another question I would like to discuss here is that are sequence models actually our ultimate sol solution? So the systems that I have um, demonstrated are based on this uh, bidirectional OSTMs. So if we have a paragraph like this, is the bidirectional OSTM, the sequence models, re really the final solution we want? Actually, I personally think the answer is no. So we have spent so many years trying to build these tools, trying to understand the syntactic structure between the, the words in a sentence. And we are also trying to understand the, the preference, uh, um, whether two entities in the paragraph are actually correct with each other. So uh, probably a very promising direction the next is that can we actually try to combine the sequence models and also this symbolic knowledge from the um, syntax parse trees and the reference systems and to combine the, uh, the best of the both worlds and to generate the next, uh, next round of models. So finally, I actually have a slide just for fun. So this sounds, this is some, these are some outputs that actually, uh, the, from our Dr. QA system. So we actually try to ask the um, system some funny questions. So, so we try to ask the, what is the meaning of life? Do, do you know the answer to this? <laughs> so the system answers actually, what is the meaning you're asking? <laughs> and we ask another question, who will solve artificial intelligence? And the system answers, hmm, tough one, I would say <laughs> computers. So it also says that, okay, the current system probably are not good enough and there's still a lot of room for improvement. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I will end here, thanks for listening and uh, I'm happy to take questions. And in the end, actually I want to make a, a, a bit of advertisement. So. I've been working on this reading comprehension um, for like about two years. And uh, we, for the next year, we are going to organize a workshop. We call it the Machine Reading for Question Answering at ACL, uh, at ACL. And uh, we really hope to have more people to get involved and uh, participate in the reading comprehension research. That's it, thanks. <laughs>